Good morning and welcome to Begin in the Word. Today we continue our study on learning from Haggai. And as we draw to the end of chapter 2, we're going to look at some things that Haggai said about kingdoms being overthrown. Let's open up with our review questions. Number one, what does shaking heaven and earth represent in Haggai 2, verse 20 through 22? Number two, what kingdoms did God overthrow in bringing about his plan? Number three, when did God give kingdom authority to Christ? With those questions in view now, let's go to the text for our study. Haggai 2, verse 20 through 22. Here the Bible says, And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots of those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. Here we have a, a promise or prophecy uh, from God through Haggai's words uh, that repeats something that he had said earlier in chapter 2. And you may recall from uh, previous studies on the book of Haggai that we've talked about this shaking of heaven and earth. And we studied passages in Hebrews that relate to that. And today's study, we're basically uh, revisiting that. And you might wonder, well, why revisit it if you've already covered it? And that's because the Lord inspired Haggai to revisit it. So we're going to look again at those things. But in today's study, we'll look at them through a different uh, perspective or uh, citing different material than what was cited in the previous discussion of this when we were looking earlier in Haggai chapter 2. In, in the reading before us here, he explains the shaking of the heavens and the earth. And it, it's not some physical earthquake or celestial anomaly. Uh, the shaking there is not a, a literal prophecy, but that is symbolic language that signifies something else. And he explains in verse 22 what that is about. He said, I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. So the shaking of heaven and earth here symbolically points to God overthrowing uh, Gentile kingdoms because he goes on to, to talk about the strength of Gentile kingdoms. And so within Haggai's message to Judah about rebuilding the temple, there's also this message about God's future temple and, and, and the spiritual temple, the church. Within Haggai's message uh, to Judah about their status as God's physical kingdom, there's a message about the future spiritual kingdom, the Lord's church. And we've discussed a lot of those things in our previous studies on Haggai's wonderful book. So what we're looking at today is other things that relate to this stream of thought. What kind of Gentile kingdoms or physical kingdoms did God overthrow as he ushered Judah forward in their plans to rebuild the temple and move on in the years that followed the reconstruction of that temple? And uh, perhaps more especially, what physical or Gentile kingdoms did God overthrow in the work of his spiritual temple and the spiritual kingdom, the Lord's church? Well, in discussion of this, let's turn our attention to another prophecy from another prophet a few years earlier that has a similar element or theme to it. There I'm talking about the prophet Daniel and his prophecy working off of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. Here Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream about this terrible image that had a head of gold, a chest of silver, belly and thighs of brass or bronze, and then the legs were of iron, and as you move towards the feet, the iron was mingled with clay. And here we get to the point in the vision where a stone comes and destroys that image. He said in verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. 
and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, in explaining what all of this means about a stone destroying the, the image and the different sections of that image representing these worldly kingdoms, which we'll review in a moment, after all that, uh, Daniel explains what that stone represents. In verse 44, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. So here he explains that in the, in the days of these kings, which refers to that fourth section of the image, and that fourth section is the Roman Empire, as we'll talk about in a moment, God will set up his kingdom. That kingdom is the church. And in that kingdom work, he's going to break in pieces and consume all those worldly kingdoms. And that would relate to God's kingdom work with the church. Well, let's talk about those kingdoms, and let's talk about their rise and their fall, and how that in doing that or in uh, tearing down one kingdom and bringing up another kingdom, as Daniel foretells here, God was furthering his kingdom work. Going to a likeness of that image, we have the review that Babylon was represented by this head of gold, the chest and the arms of silver. That was Persia or the Medo-Persian Empire. The belly and thighs represented Greece. And then the legs being of iron and then iron mingled with clay, that represents the Roman Empire. So think about these worldly kingdoms that uh, were in power from the years of uh, uh, just before Haggai's time moving forward until the time of Christ. Haggai came in and prophesied in Judah after they were released from Babylonian captivity, after the kingdom of Babylon had been overthrown by the Persians. So Haggai was laboring under the reign of Darius Hystaspas, a Persian king, but after the Persian Empire uh, uh, existed for a few years, they were overthrown by the Greek Empire. And that is foretold uh, in El uh, other places in the Old Testament scriptures, namely in the book of Daniel, as an example. But eventually, Greece was overthrown by Rome. So when you look at the prophecy of Daniel 2, and you think about a, a stone coming in and uh, whacking this image at the feet and grinding all these kingdoms into power symbolically, that's the same thing Haggai was talking about when Haggai talked about the shaking of the heaven and the earth. What's that about? That's about shaking the nations. That's about God manipulating the rise and fall of these various nations as he brought about his kingdom plan. Think not only of these world empires, that ruled in the area around Israel throughout their history. Think of other kingdoms around Judah and in the ancient world. Think of the kingdoms that preceded Babylon, such as Assyria or Egypt. Think of those smaller kingdoms right there neighboring Israel, uh, the Syrians, the Phoenicians, the Philistines, the Edomites, uh, the Midianites, other nations such as them. All of those were Gentile kingdoms. And think of the rise and the fall of those kingdoms as God moved Israel patiently forward in his timeline as he patiently unfolded his plan to bring his son into the world. And think of the promise of that son having kingdom authority. Psalms 2 is an example passage where there's promises about the Messiah and the promise that he would rule the nations or that he would have divine authority over the nations, which that's what God is insinuating here in the prophecy in Haggai 2. Psalms 2, verse 7 through 9. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now let's key in on some language here. God is promising the Messiah, his son, that he would be begotten. We'll talk in a moment about what that means. And he's promising, I'll give you the nations. That's the Gentiles. I'm gonna shake things up. What's he gonna do to these nations? He's going to break them. 
He's going to dash them in pieces. That's just like Daniel's language about that stone coming in, grinding those different nations into powder. That's a lot like Haggai's language in Haggai too of God shaking the heaven and the earth or God bringing to an end or destroying or controlling these Gentile kingdoms. And what's that all got to do with? Well, the psalmist here connects that with God's son being begotten. Now, under inspiration of the spirit in Acts 13, the apostle Paul preached about Jesus and he called this psalm to mind. In Acts 13, verse 32 and 33, he said, we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus as it also is written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And what does Paul say that this son of God being begotten is about? He said that's about when Jesus was raised from the dead. And what happened when God raised Jesus from the dead? He fulfilled these promises that were made of old. So we go back to Psalms 2 when he speaks to his son, the son of God. He said, I've begotten you. The apostle Paul says that's about the resurrection of Jesus. And that's when God fulfilled the promises of old of salvation. And those promises entail language of Jesus being given control of the nations and breaking those nations. Consider the rise and the fall of the different nations of the Gentiles as God brought about his kingdom plan. God rose up the Babylonians to punish sinful Judah. Before then, he had risen up the Assyrians to punish the sinful northern kingdom. But when they had fulfilled his plan, God brought the Assyrians down and replaced them with the Babylonians. And when they had fulfilled their work in God's scheme, he brought them down and replaced them with the Persians, whom he had used to bring Judah back to the land and to rebuild the land and the temple. And when he was done with them, he brought in the Greeks. And then as he destroyed the Greeks, he brought in the Romans, who had a hand in crucifying his son in completion of his plan to redeem fallen man, to offer salvation to a sin-stricken world. And eventually, God brought down the Roman kingdom. And what other kingdoms, those other kingdoms that surrounded Judah, have risen and fallen through the years as God worked his eternal plan? We can see Haggai's uh, promise coming to fruition in the, the work of God in bringing up and tearing down worldly kingdoms. And God has bestowed that kind of work upon his son because Jesus has risen from the dead and rules now on his throne. And God is still in control of the kingdoms of the world as he brings about his plan. Consider now the questions. What does shaking heaven and earth represent? In Haggai 2, verse 20 through 22, the passage says that represents the overthrow of worldly kingdoms. What kingdoms did God overthrow in bringing about his plan? Well, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, to name just a few. When did God give this kingdom authority to Christ? According to Psalms 2 and the way the apostle Paul uh, interpreted that passage in his sermon in Acts 13. He gave that kingdom authority to Christ when he raised him from the dead. I hope you enjoyed our study today with beginning the word. I'm so glad that you've begun today in the word. And I pray that as you've begun today in the word, that you'll live out today and every day in God's word, bearing in mind that God's son rules among the kingdoms of men and brings about his will that relates the salvation of his people. Thank you, and God bless.